Today we are going to start talking about molecules and at the beginning we will talk about valence bond theory. Now bonding is something that we know very well and we know that bonding is the reason why atoms join up and form molecules and that is why we have these two big fat nuclei which are so close to each other but still they are happy because they are sort of shielded from each other because of all the electrons that are there. To study bonding earlier uh, when we were in high school we have studied things like say Lewis atom uh, Lewis electron dot structure kind of approach. Here we will go a little further and discuss two different approaches one is valence bond approach and the other is molecular orbital approach. Of these valence bond theory is very very simple in fact it is just Lewis electron dot model rewritten in the language of quantum mechanics. So, uh, that is what we are going to start with. Valence bond theory essentially uses the same concept that was there in Lewis theory. It works with overlap of atomic orbitals and sharing of electron pairs. The only difference is that now we talk about wave nature of electrons. Now we make use of wave functions. In fact, this simple theory works fine for so many systems. However, there are problems. It is strictly written for limit for uh, 2 center 2 electron situations that is where Lewis model works best. So, if there is anything other than 2 centers if there is delocalization then valence bond theory does not work. Once again one can try to extend the sc scope of valence bond theory by using things like resonance, but beyond the limit uh, the inadequacy becomes very very prominent. The other problem is that it cannot really describe excited states all that well. When we are done with this discussion that we want to perform about valence bond theory we will see that we do get to understand something about some excited states, but it is not really complete. That way molecular orbital theory is much better. In this theory we consider the electrons to move in the joint field of nuclei. Setting up Hamiltonian is there in valence bond as well as molecular orbital theory. Now for MOT it turns out that it is exactly solvable Schrodinger equation is exactly solvable for H2 plus, but not for more complex molecules. Then what we want to find are molecular orbitals, but since you cannot really solve Schrodinger equation for more anything more than H2 plus we construct the molecular orbitals by taking a linear combination of atomic orbitals. This molecular orbital theory can actually handle delocalization very well it gives us access to excited states uh, very naturally. So, it is a general theory the problem with this is that sometimes it overdoes things more about that when we actually discuss molecular orbital theory. For now let us start worrying about valence bond theory and a good point to start discussing anything to do with quantum mechanics is to try and formulate the Hamiltonian. So, we will start from something we know already hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom as we know has uh, one nucleus and one electron of course, uh, if we if you remember what we have studied earlier uh, exact the equation Schrodinger equation is actually separated into two parts one associated with the motion of center of mass and the other associated with a motion of the reduced mass with respect to the center of mass. But the reduced mass is for all practical purposes the electron the center of mass is for all practical purposes the nucleus that is why uh, we will write things like ma and me uh, without losing too much of generality. So, uh, here since we are going to bring in another nucleus anyway we start with this notation h a so, h a means hydrogen atom a. So, uh, what will be the terms in Hamiltonian here kinetic energy term for the nucleus a minus h cross square by 2 ma del a square minus h cross square by 2 ma del e square this gives us the kinetic energy term for the Hamiltonian uh, in electron. The third one minus q e square by r a is the potential energy term for attraction of electron by the nucleus very simple. We are going to go to h 2 molecule for that we have to add a nucleus a proton essentially and we have to add a second electron let us do that step by step. To start with uh, let us add the nucleus H B. So, this here is the second hydrogen atom nucleus H B. How would 
the Hamiltonian get modified upon introduction of the second nucleus. Well, let us see uh, what are the additional interactions that come in. This electron that is there remember there is still one electron we have not added the second electron yet. The electron in addition to its attraction by A is also attracted by B that is one thing. Uh, this nucleus B is going to have its own kinetic energy and there is going to be a nucleus nucleus repulsion that is where this capital R internuclear separation becomes extremely useful. So, these are the terms kinetic energy term for nucleus B electrostatic uh, attraction of the electron by the nucleus B and nucleus nucleus repulsion. So, already we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 terms. What happens when we bring in one more electron? This is the situation for uh, H2 molecule dihydrogen molecule. Then in addition to whatever we have written earlier we have these 3 terms that we have highlighted. First will naturally be the kinetic energy term for the second nuclear second electron then uh, well 4 terms actually. Then we are going to have uh, the term for potential energy for attraction of the second nucleus by the second electron by nucleus A another term for electrostatic attraction between the second electron and nucleus B minus Q square by R 2 A for A E attraction minus Q square by R 2 B for uh, B E attraction E here is the second electron. Additionally now we are going to have an electron electron repulsion term that as we will see eventually is going to become very very messy. Well it is going to be messy and we are going to uh, try to find approximate methods to work around it. Now the first thing that we need to do is use some kind of approximation and the approximation that is used here is born Oppenheimer approximation which in very simple terms says that when we talk about electrons we can assume that the nuclei are stationary. Station, uh, the nuclei are much more bulkier uh, particles. So, for movement of the light electrons these big fat nuclei we do not have to consider that they are moving. So, we consider them to be stationary and immediately things start becoming a little simpler. Why? Because we do not have to worry about these two terms anymore. If the nuclei are stationary then we do not really need to consider the terms in Hamiltonian for the kinetic energy of nucleus A or kinetic energy of nucleus B that is very nice. Secondly what we can do is we can take this capital R internuclear separation to be uh, stationary to be the same constant. Well uh, we are not saying that it is always constant what we are saying is that we can hold it for a as a constant for any ca particular calculation as we will see what we can do essentially is that fix this value of R and do a calculation then change the value of R do another calculation and therefore uh, that way get a dependence of the energy of the system on the internuclear separation also. So far so good the problem is that this minus q plus q is square by R 1 2 the electron electron repulsion term there is no way you can take it to be a constant. So, we need further approximation we cannot solve Schrodinger equation the only way out is to try to think what are uh, reasonably good wave functions and then trying to see whether using these wave functions we can find some um, little roundabout way of figuring out the energies also. This is how we do it. First of all let us think what the wave function would be when the nuclei are at an infinitely di infinite distance apart. When I say infinite I do not mean uh, millions of light years or something about 10 angstrom is sufficient for infinity because uh, in this case uh, beyond that distance uh, the internuclear interaction is really very small we can neglect it. What happens in this situation when they are sufficiently far away then we can assume that electron number 1 is in 1s orbital of uh, A and electron number 2 is in 1s orbital of B. A and B stand for the 2 atoms or in other words the 2 nuclei this is what it is and remember psi A and psi B the way we have written it 
they are actually 1s orbitals. In hindsight, I should have written phi a and phi b that would have been better, but well, uh, the die is cast. So, please bear with me. The small is small psi a small psi b are 1s orbitals, remember they are normalized, and capital psi here is the wave function of the molecule that we are trying to write. At infinite separation, wave function would be psi a1 multiplied by psi b2, electron number 1 in A, electron number 2 in B. Not very difficult. What happens when they are very close? Let us say when the internuclear separation is equal to the equilibrium bond length. At that time, you cannot assume that electron number 1 is in atom A only or moves in the field of nucleus A only. You have to also consider that it experiences the field by nucleus B. So, what we can do is we can write like this. We can write two terms. First term is as usual what we had written earlier psi A1 psi B2. Second term that we can write is psi A2 psi B1 exchange. Now, we say that this is the possibility of electron number 2 being in uh, atom A, electron number 1 being in atom B uh, to put it in a very very crude manner. Okay, we are assuming that atoms are uh, retaining their identities in the molecule and this is how we are formulating it. Okay. So, now neither of these wave functions is sufficient to describe the situation completely. So, to get a complete picture what we need to do is that we need to take a linear combination of these two combinations of these uh, two situations, two wave functions. First one we call psi 1, second one is called psi 2. We take a linear combination C1 psi 1 plus C2 psi 2. Do we know what C1 is? Do we know what psi C2 is? We do not know. But let us see how we can go ahead with this anyway. So, even though we do not know how to solve it, nothing prevents us from writing the Schrodinger equation because we know Hamiltonian we have some wave function that we think is good. So, uh, this wave function by the way is called Heitler and London wave function after the names of the scientists who proposed them. So, Heitler and London did this phenomenal uh, exercise of proposing a wave function that made sense and how much sense is something that we are going to see shortly. All right. So, with this we can write Schrodinger equation. Okay. So, we write Schrodinger equation and we try to see how we can use some kind of approximation to find energies and coefficients. Energies, how do we find the energies and how do we find, how do we determine the values of C1 and C2. That is what we are going to uh, indulge a discussion upon uh, in the next module.